Alors, monsieur, bonjour et bienvenue à cette émission spéciale ici à TVC22 sur les élections fédérales du 19 octobre. Aujourd'hui, j'ai le plaisir de vous présenter celui qui nous sert depuis neuf ans, notre député fédéral pour Glengarry Prescott Russell, M. Pierre Lemieux. Bonjour, Pierre. Bonjour, Jacques. Comment allez-vous? Ça va très bien. Le premier point que j'ai retenu de la, du programme du parti, c'est la création d'emplois. Et à ce sujet, le Parti conservateur dit que le Canada est l'un des meilleurs, a un des meilleurs bilans des, euh, des pays du G7 oui. en fait de, de création d'emplois. Donc, combien d'emplois votre gouvernement a-t-il créé? Et ce, depuis le creux de la grande récession mondiale. Euh, premièrement, il faut euh, jeter un coup d'œil euh, au monde. Parce que je dis qu'il y a une récession mondiale et quand on regarde la Grèce, l'Espagne, l'Italie, la France, on voit euh, les crises, les crises économiques. Ici au Canada, notre euh, économie est menacée par la récession mondiale, mais on est beaucoup plus stable. Et pourquoi? Est-ce que c'est juste par la chance? Pas vraiment, parce que quand on regarde les États-Unis, nos partenaires au sud, il y a une crise là euh, qui, euh, qui est arrivée. Alors, ici au Canada, nous avons eu un gouvernement conservateur avec les politiques euh, économiques qui euh, ont stabilisé euh, notre économie. Est-ce que tout est parfait et beau? Pas du tout. On, on, on reste menacé par euh, les facteurs économiques de partout euh, dans le monde. Mais est-ce qu'on a les meilleures mesures pour protéger et renforcer euh, notre économie pour créer les emplois? Oui, certainement. Vous avez dit que euh, ce n'est pas nous autres qui dit qu'on a un des meilleurs bilans au point de vue de la création d'emplois entre les pays G7. Ça, c'était fait et dit par, dans un rapport euh, d'une association indépendante de gouvernement. Alors, euh, nous avons un très bon bilan, c'est vrai. Une réponse spécifique à votre question. Euh, depuis euh, la, la récession, il y avait la création d'emplois ici au Canada, euh, une gang de 1,3 million de nouveaux emplois nets. Net veut dire que oui, il y avait les pertes dans quelques secteurs. Mais à la fin de la journée, après les pertes, il y avait la création de, il reste euh, les nouveaux emplois, 1,3 million de nouveaux emplois. Pendant le gouvernement, 80, au moins 80 de ces nouveaux emplois se trouvent dans le secteur privé, et c'est mieux comme ça. On ne veut pas avoir un gouvernement euh, avec toute la création d'emplois dans le gouvernement. Et deuxième chose, euh, 80 des nouveaux emplois sont euh, 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 dans le secteur euh, oui, privé et aussi, euh, oh, j'oublie, euh, oh oui, excusez-moi, au temps plein, sont en, en temps plein. Oui, et ça, c'est important aussi parce que l'opposition dit, « Oh oui, il y avait la création d'emplois, mais c'est te temporaire. » Non, nope, c'est au temps plein. Et deuxième chose, deux tiers de ces emplois offrent les salaires hauts, ou, ou mis à haut, alors les, les bons emplois. Les bons emplois, Alors, c'est grâce à nos, nos facteurs. Quant à nous, comme les conservateurs, c'est mieux qu'on baisse, et on a baissé, euh, les taxes et les impôts sur les entreprises. Parce, pourquoi oui, c'est parce que c'est les petites, les moyennes et les grandes entreprises qui créent les emplois. Alors, si on aimerait que euh, les, les commerces créent les emplois, il faut laisser plus de leur argent dans leurs entreprises et ils vont savoir mieux comment dépenser l'argent pour agrandir. Et voilà le succès. Okay. M. Walker, il dit qu'il y a 300 000 personnes mm -hmm. de plus sur l'assurance-emploi ou qui n'ont pas d'emploi depuis le creux de la récession. Est-ce que c'est vrai, selon vous? Je ne sais pas. Je, je sais que le taux de... de comment dire ça? Des, euh, les gens qui cherchent l'emploi. Oui, les, les, okay, les taux des de gens qui cherchent les emplois est à peu près 6,9 ouais, Oui, c'est environ 7, 7 selon les derniers chiffres de Statistique Canada oui, de la semaine passée. Une des plus bas. Sur la population une, active. Oui, une des plus bas. Et euh, oui, il y avait quelques secteurs qui ont perdu quelques emplois, c'est vrai, mais c'est pourquoi je dis qu'à la fin de la journée, l'économie canadienne, dans tous les secteurs, crée les emplois, mm -hmm. le 1,3 million de, de travail, euh, excuse-moi, d'emplois. Mais nous avons aussi annoncé pendant ce campagne les mesures spécifiques 
pour euh, améliorer ou pour renforcer le secteur manufacturier. D'accord. Mais ça, c'est c'est beau ce qui a été fait. Mais une élection, une élection que ce soit fédérale ou provinciale, oui. c'est pour ce qui va être fait. Oui. Donc, dans les prochaines années, combien d'emplois avez-vous comme objectif de créer? Uh, ça, c'est une bonne question. La première ministre a dit qu'un gouvernement conservateur réélu va s'engager de créer ou d'être impliqué dans la création de notre 1,3 million d'emplois nets. Alors, doubler uh, qu -ce que était, uh, les emplois qui étaient déjà uh, créés. Et uh, ça, c'est, nous avons, c'est un engagement, une promesse uh, solide, parce que nous avons un bilan solide. Uh, on l'a déjà fait, on va le refaire encore. Et je pense que ça, c'est très important. Vous avez parlé des Canadiens qui cherchent les emplois. La, la meilleure nouvelle pour quelqu'un qui cherche un emploi est qu'il y a les emplois qui existent pour les autres. Alors, ça, c'est, nous, nous disons, comme uh, la, les conservateurs, nous ciblons la création d'emplois. On l'a déjà fait. On va continuer de le faire. Et ça, c'était une annonce pendant cette élection. D'accord. Le deuxième point que j'aimerais discuter, puis ça touche encore l'emploi, c'est de protéger les emplois. Parce que là, ils sont là, mais on oui. ne veut pas qu'ils se produisent, ce qui s'est produit dans les dernières dix années environ, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Où, et, et plus, où il y a plusieurs emplois qui ont laissé le pays. Qu'allez-vous faire de plus que ce que vous avez fait présentement? Bien, voilà, vous avez annoncé un programme euh, que nous avons déposé euh, pendant les élections. Ça va être un investissement de 100 millions de dollars pour aider euh, le secteur euh, manufacturier. Et certainement, il y a un euh, point très important, euh, et ça c'est, euh, il y a les idées, mais il faut livrer les idées sur le marché. Oui. Il y a une grande distance entre les deux. Alors, avec le 100 millions de dollars, on aimerait faire des investissements pour aider le secteur manufacturier de, de transformer leurs idées jusqu'un produit qu'il offre euh, aux Canadiens euh, dans le marché. Alors, 100 millions de dollars, mais aussi, j'aimerais souligner un autre point. Euh, par exemple, euh, the Canada Pension Plan, oui. alors le CPP. Mm -hmm. euh, nous autres, comme les conservateurs, nous disons que le CPP va, reste, va rester comme il est maintenant. Mais les libéraux aimeraient augmenter le CPP. Justin Trudeau a, si, a dit qu'il appuie uh, Kathleen Wynne et il aimerait implanter exactement le même programme partout au Canada. Qu'est-ce que ça veut dire pour le secteur manufacturier? Mais je vais commencer mon réponse avec qu'est-ce que ça veut dire pour vous, un employé. Vous êtes un employé, vous gagnez un salaire de 60 000 L'augmentation dans le CPP va vous coûter 1 000 additionnels chaque année. Alors, vous allez perdre 1 000 chaque année. Vous allez avoir moins euh, d'argent dans votre poche grâce à cette augmentation libérale. Mais moi, comme employeur, je dois euh, matcher euh, votre contribution. Alors, moi, je dois contribuer moi-même, euh, comme entreprise, 1 million, excusez-moi, 1 000 dollars pour, euh, pour, ça c'est mon part oui. de, de, de la contribution. OK, si j'ai 60 employés, ça va me coûter euh, 60 000 dollars. Je peux vous dire, quand je rencontre les propriétaires, pas les propriétaires, les entrepreneurs de chez nous, les petites et moyennes entreprises, je, je ne rencontre pas euh, trop qui disent, oui, j'ai 60 000 dollars pour donner ça au Parti libéral ou, ou à un gouvernement libéral par le CPP. Le CFIB, ça c'est la Fédération des entreprises indépendantes, ils font les sondages toujours. Plus de 60%, si je me, je, je me rappelle bien, ont dit que comme entrepreneur, il faudrait euh, euh, mettre sur pied les employés pour payer les frais additionnels à leur commerce si le CPP, les coûts de CPP sont augmentés par la partie libérale. Ça va tuer les emplois. Il y aura moins d'emplois. Alors, de notre côté conservateur, on va continuer avec les politiques économiques pour créer les emplois. On l'a déjà fait, on a un bilan solide, on l'a fait, on va le faire encore. Parti libéral, bien, il nous offre la dette, déficit, les taxes plus haut, CPP plus haut, ça va tuer les emplois. Alors, voilà le, le, le contraste entre les deux parties et la création d'emplois. L'autre sujet que j'aimerais toucher, qui relève toujours de votre programme, c'est 
protéger nos enfants. Mm -hmm. Et à cet égard, c'était le premier ministre euh, Stephen Harper a annoncé le plan du gouvernement conservateur réélu pour assurer mm -hmm. la sécurité des communautés et services contre les criminels. Mm -hmm. Quelle nouvelle mesure de loi allez-vous introduire pour atteindre cet objectif? Oui, bien, on va prendre les mesures pour mieux protéger les enfants. C'est évident, comme un gouvernement conservateur, on est pour les victimes, on est contre la crime. On a pris plusieurs mesures, c'est plus de 80 mesures pour mieux protéger les Canadiens contre la crime et pour être plus sévère avec les, les criminels. Au point de vue des enfants, nous avons annoncé pendant euh, la campagne électorale qu'on aimerait doubler les fonds des organisations qui existent pour faire les poursuites pour mieux protéger euh, les enfants, pour, pour, qui, qui, qui défendent euh, les enfants qui sont victimes de la crime. Mais aussi, hors des centres urbains, on aimerait augmenter les fonds euh, qui sont accessibles aux organisations qui aussi desservir ou protègent euh, la, la, les enfants. Mmh. Et dernière chose, on aimerait mettre en place les, les études pour mieux comprendre le, le dommage, qui, les, les conséquences négatives, le dommage euh, qui arrive avec la crime. Il faut dire que les conséquences invisibles, ce n'est pas toujours évident, euh, toutes les conséquences, mais c'est important pour le gouvernement et pour les Canadiens de reconnaître que, oui, il y a les conséquences qui touchent pas juste la victime, mais peut-être sa famille, peut-être euh, la communauté, quand il y a la crime contre euh, les enfants. Okay. Je suis d'accord avec tout ce que tu avances là, puis tu parles au nom du parti, donc je n'ai pas discuté avec ça. Là où j'ai un peu de difficulté, c'est que vous êtes le parti du « tough on crime oui. » et vous aviez, pour les quatre dernières années, un gouvernement majoritaire. Oui. Alors, pourquoi est-ce que cette loi-là, qui est importante, il faut oui. l'avouer, n'a pas été avancée à la Chambre des communes? Oui, c'est un, une bonne question. Et, et c'est pourquoi j'ai voulu dire euh, que nous avons pris presque 80 mesures contre la crime. Alors, oui, c'était essentiel, c'était primordial dans notre bilan, dans notre plan pour le Canada. On a pris, on a passé les projets de loi pour, être, pour mieux protéger les victimes et pour mieux protéger les enfants, les femmes qui sont les victimes de la crime euh, violent ou de la crime sexuelle. Et on a mis en place, par exemple, pour la première fois euh, dans l'histoire du Canada, le charter de victimes pour dévoiler pour souligner les droits des victimes. Alors, mais il faut dire que euh, les, les dernières euh, quatre ans n'étaient pas faciles non plus. Euh, il y avait beaucoup de jeux politiques joués dans la Chambre et euh, les partis de l'opposition, les libéraux et les MPD, ont essayé de retarder chaque projet de loi qui était déposé devant la Chambre. Pourquoi Bien, parce que si le gouvernement, n est, n est, à la fin de leur bilan, si le gouvernement dit « Hey, euh, on n'a rien fait », ah, bien, ça, ce n'est pas un bon, bon message. Alors, si l'opposition est capable de retarder tout le travail dans la Chambre, bon, il gagne. Mais nous autres, nous avons pris les mesures aussi pour assurer qu'on était capable d'implanter les projets de loi qui étaient devant la Chambre. Et c'est pourquoi je dis que nous avons euh, livré sur 80 mesures contre la crime. Et ça, c'est sans compter toutes les autres mesures, les initiatives et les projets de loi pour aider l'économie, la, la création d'emplois, de, de, la sécurité du Canada, l'immigration, euh, la défense nationale, l'environnement et toutes les autres euh, choses très importantes aux Canadiens. D'accord. Le prochain point que j'aimerais toucher, c'est sur les aînés canadiens. Mm -hmm. Et ici, c'est marqué que notre parti le Parti conservateur va offrir un nouveau soutien pour les aînés célibataires et veufs aux Canadiens. Mm -hmm. Pouvez-vous nous donner les détails de, de ce projet de loi-là? Oui, ça va être un crédit d'impôt qui va aider les aînés euh, seuls. Et voici un message que j'ai reçu chez moi. Euh, comme vous savez, comme député, euh, j'apprécie beaucoup les commentaires. Je, je, je lis les commentaires envoyés à moi par la population de chez nous. Et il y avait plusieurs 
euh, aînés qui ont dit, hey, vous avez, par exemple, euh, introduit le fractionnement de pension, mm -hmm. bien et beau, mais je suis seul. Euh, mon conjoint est décédé ou, ou je, je, je vis une, une, une vie seule. Alors, qu'est-ce que vous faites pour moi? Et c'est important de n'oublier pas les aînés qui sont seuls. OK? J'ai bien entendu le message et c'est partie de mon travail comme député de transmettre de tra de, de, ce message à notre gouvernement, de travailler avec mes collègues. Et voilà un résultat. Alors, ça va être, euh, c'est une mesure crédit d'impôt euh, qui cible euh, les aînés qui sont seuls et ils vont euh, gagner les, les centaines de dollars à la fin de l'année. À peu près, en, la, la moyenne, euh, ils vont euh, gagner par à peu près 600 dollars chaque année grâce à ces mesures ici. Et ça ne compte pas toutes les autres mesures que nous avons prises pour aider les aînés, comme je dis, le fractionnement de revenus, mais aussi nous avons, par exemple, euh, doublé euh, l'exemption le crédit d'impôt ou l'exemption pour um, l'âge de 65 ans, il y a, on a doublé uh, une exemption aussi pour les personnes qui reçoivent déjà uh, une pension. On a baissé la TPS. On a pris plusieurs mesures pour aider les aînés. Et uh, jusqu'à maintenant, sans la mesure-là, on a aidé uh, 300 000 uh, aînés à uh, uh, quitter la pauvreté. Alors, on est très, très fiers de notre bilan et voilà une, une promesse. Et nous avons un bon bilan au sujet de nos promesses. Quand les conservateurs disent qu'on va faire quelque chose, on le fait. Alors, on va livrer, si on est réélu, on va livrer euh, sur ce, cette promesse. Oui, je me souviens, en, en 2011, euh, tous les projets de loi qui ont été passés par les conservateurs, ça faisait tourner la tête. On se demandait qu'est-ce qu'il oui. était pour avoir après, là, parce que oui. c'est comme ça que le mandat a commencé, avec euh, oui. presque toutes les promesses électorales passées en six mois ou quelque chose de semblable. Oui, on a un bon bilan. Par exemple, nous, nous avons dit on, on va éliminer le déficit. On l'a fait. On va livrer, quand on élimine euh, le déficit, on va livrer le fractionnement de revenus pour les familles. On le fait. Euh, alors, on, on, on va aussi, euh, baisser la TPS. On l'a fait. On va aider les familles directement avec l'argent pour les aider avec le coût de vie, on l'a fait. Alors, on a un bon bilan. Au, au mois de janvier, <coughs> tu as accepté euh, un nouveau poste comme secrétaire parlementaire pour mm -hmm. euh, nos anciens combattants. Oui. Et on sait que plusieurs de nos anciens combattants reviennent des, des, des démissions auxquelles nous, les Canadiens, nous les avons envoyées. Et, et reviennent et ont besoin beaucoup de, de soins médicaux et autres. Oui. Qu'est-ce que le gouvernement conservateur planifie de faire pour les aider encore plus, euh, oui. parce qu'ils ont, ont besoin de plus d'aide, c'est évident. Oui. Il y a le nouveau SHELT pour les anciens combattants. Moi, je suis un ancien combattant moi-même. Le nouveau SHELT était euh, euh, formulé par l'ancien gouvernement libéral après une grande consultation avec les anciens combattants, les vétérans eux-mêmes, pour savoir mieux qu'est-ce que les vétérans aimeraient avoir au point de vue de l'appui pour les aider à continuer avec leur vie, de chercher les emplois pour lever leur famille hors de militaire. Alors, le charte était implanté par chaque parti, chaque... C'était passé unanime dans la Chambre des communes. C'était appuyé par chaque député. Mais il y avait les trous, les lacunes, euh, les choses qui... Euh, C'était nécessaire d'améliorer la charte. Et on le fait, on continuait de le faire comme le gouvernement conservateur. Et depuis janvier, j'étais impliqué euh, dans quelques initiatives. J'ai rencontré les, euh, les vétérans partout au Canada. Et juste avant la fin de la session euh, sur, euh, au Parlement, euh, en juin, on a passé un projet de loi, un, un beau projet de loi, pour aider les anciens combattants. Il y avait, il y avait quatre ou cinq mesures signi significatives pour les anciens combattants qui étaient appuyées par euh, les anciens combattants. Comme les conservateurs, nous avons voté pour ces mesures. Les NPD et les, euh, les libéraux ont voté contre les mesures. Je ne sais pas pourquoi, parce que euh, depuis longtemps, ils disaient hey, il faut améliorer, ces, améliorer ça, il faut faire plus ici. On l'a fait juste avant euh, la fin de la session et ils ont, à la fin de la journée, décidé de voter contre. Alors, nous avons un bilan, et, uh, un bilan pour améliorer euh, toujours le service 
euh, livrés à nos anciens combattants. Pendant le, la campagne électorale, le premier ministre euh, a annoncé une autre mesure. Euh, des fois, quand euh, un ancien combattant trouve un emploi, peut-être temporaire, ça peut affecter la pension qu'il reçoit. Alors, le, le premier, ministre, euh, premier ministre a dit qu'on va augmenter euh, ce limite-là parce qu'on aimerait qu'il soit possible pour le vétéran de gagner plus d'argent avec la même pension. En, collectant la même, en recevant la même pension. Oui, oui exactement. Merci. D'accord. Vous, vous l'avez dit mieux que moi. Mais, <rire> mais, mais l'autre chose, il y a, il y a un esprit euh, et il y a un engagement de notre gouvernement de continuer de travailler en étroite collaboration avec les anciens combattants et avec les autres députés et les autres partis pour continuer d'améliorer les services pour les anciens combattants. Puis, parlant de militaires, ça va être ma dernière question. Nos, nos militaires ont, ont besoin d'équipement, ont besoin oui. de renouveler l'équipement, que ce soit au niveau des, des avions de chasse, que ce mm -hmm. soit au niveau des, mm -hmm. les, des navires pour la, pour la marine canadienne. Euh, mais ce processus-là semble être arrêté. Mm -hmm. On dirait que, ce, le, que le processus d'acquisition a, 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 a trébuche sur des embûches et... Et ça retarde de tout. D'ailleurs, la semaine passée, il y a des experts qui ont dit que le gouvernement canadien, pour le même montant d'argent, ne peut pas avoir tous les vaisseaux qu'il qu voulait avoir. Il va, il, va, il va en manquer. Donc, qu'est-ce que vous allez faire pour redémarrer le processus pour que nos militaires soient bien équipés du mieux que ce qu'on… Qu selon ce qu'on est capable de payer, évidemment, mais… Il, au lieu d'attendre de, de, des années et des années, il, il faut que oui, ça oui, avance de tout. Là. Moi, moi j'étais dans la force armée pendant 20 ans et euh, j'étais là pendant les années noires du Parti libéral. Et moi, j'étais un officier euh, de l'armée, officier de l'entretien. Alors, c'était moi et mon équipe qui euh, ont fait les réparations à l'équipement de la force armée et je peux vous dire, les années étaient difficiles. Uh, quand on était le gouvernement en 2006, on a commencé tout de suite avec les grands achats. On a acheté les, um, les, CD, les CD7, uh, les, les grands, grands avions pour transporter nos oui. équipements à l'étranger. Cinq uh, mm -hmm. grands avions, les Globaster. Nous avons acheté les, uh, les blindés uh, armés uh, Leopard 2 pour nos opérations en uh, Afghanistan. Nous avons acheté 15 hélicoptères. Uh, les Chinook, medium, le transport medium, uh, laissé tomber par les, 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 libida, les, les, libera, les libéraux, mais on les a réachetés uh, pour uh, l'équipement essentiel, essentiel pour notre, uh, nos forces armées canadiennes. Uh, on a mis en place un des meilleurs uh, systèmes uh, d'achat pour les uh, nouveaux um, uh, bateaux pour, uh, notre, uh, nos, pour la force uh, marine. Et euh, elle est en train euh, d'être dévoilée. Oui, est-ce qu'il y, euh, est qu y a quelques problèmes? Oui, parce que c'est la Défense nationale qui fait les grands achats de l'équipement à long terme et il faut assurer qu'il y ait un bon processus en place et que les, euh, les spécifications, les, les, les critères sont bien euh, délignés, définis, euh, définis, etc. Alors, oui, il y a quelques projets où il faut euh, avancer un peu plus lent. Mais certainement, nous avons euh, un bilan solide au point de vue de euh, l'achat d'équipements pour nos forces armées canadiennes. Et je viens de vous donner juste quelques exemples. Alors, mais et on continue euh, de le faire. Et nous avons annoncé juste avant euh, les élections qu'on va continuer d'augmenter le budget pour euh, nos forces armées euh, canadiennes. Alors, euh, je, on, on appuie comme les conservateurs. C'est évident que nous, avons, euh, que nous appuyons euh, les hommes et les femmes qui protègent le Canada euh, par leur service dans la force armée canadienne. À ce moment-ci, j'aimerais t'inviter à adresser la parole directement aux résidents de, de Clarence Rockman. Bien, merci beaucoup. Moi, je comprends très bien que la vie d'un député est une vie de service. Et je suis ici pour vous aider, pour aider les familles euh, dans n'importe quelle, dans n'importe quelle, par n'importe quelle façon. Et j'ai un bon bilan de service euh, comme euh, père de famille, euh, père de cinq enfants, 
comme euh, aussi euh, pour le Canada, parce que j'ai servi dans notre, nos forces armées canadiennes pendant 20 ans, et aussi comme votre député depuis les dernières neuf ans. Alors, je vous offre mon expérience, mon leadership et mes services. Alors, j'espère qu'en octobre, vous allez voter pour Pierre Lemieux. Euh, J'aimerais continuer de travailler pour vous et pour vos familles. Alors, merci beaucoup. And here we are today with uh, Pierre Lemieux, our federal member of parliament for Glengarry Prescott Russell, who is running in the next, the upcoming elections on October 19th, 2015. Pierre Lemieux, thank you very much for My coming pleasure. to the studio. Good, good to be here. Good to be um, back. To get you to fit us into your schedule, wow. Okay, <laughs> my pleasure. Why did you choose to join the Conservatives in 2006? Well, uh, I guess I can start to start by saying, like, why did I choose to even run in politics? Because um, I do not come from a political background. I'd been in the army uh, for 20 years. I'm a father of five children, so I'm a family man. What is it that made me run in politics? And um, it is this idea of service. It's this idea of serving Canadians, serving the people of my riding, 
um, as I served my family, for example, as I served in the military. So I wanted very much to serve Canadians in the best way that I knew how. Uh, and one of my children actually recommended that I run in politics. And she said, you know, Dad, if you want to change things, you should get involved. You need to get involved. So that was actually the start of a decision process which had me present myself in 2006. I chose the Conservatives because the Conservatives bo uh, best represent what I stand for and the things that they hold as important, I hold as important. And so uh, there's very good alignment and I think we do that in all of our jobs. I mean, w when I look to the people that are watching this program, they tend to work in jobs and in positions that align well with who they are and what they hold as important to them. Very few people would, would work in a high conflict uh, zone where you know nothing is working out, everything's a battle, and yet that's what it would be like, for example, if I were in the Liberal Party or if I were in the NDP Party. So there is good alignment between uh, Conservatives, uh, as what we stand for as a party, um, and what I stand for um, as a husband, as a father, as a member who served in the Canadian Armed Forces, and as a member of Parliament. I, I have to say it, but that, that almost implies that the Liberals don't stand for those things, don't stand for service, don't stand for family, don't stand for... Uh, you'll see, uh, I think one of the things Canadians want to understand, particularly in this election period, is what are the differences uh, between Conservatives and liberals, and certainly between the platforms. Like, you know, it can be very confusing. And um, I think the national media um, need to communicate to Canadians, what are the parties actually offering you? I mean, right now there are a lot of headlines that are on very sort of sideline issues. But in terms of what are the differences between, for example, conservatives and liberals? So I'll just give you an example. Um, we believe as conservatives that you work hard for your money, that Canadians work hard for their money. We believe that they should keep more of their own money. They know best how to spend their money on themselves, on their families to meet their priorities. If we can lower taxes, that's what we should do. We've lowered about 180 taxes since 2006. The tax burden, the federal tax burden in Canada is at its lowest point in 50 years. This is remarkable. Um, the average family in Canada, two parents, two children, pays about $6,600 less in federal tax than they did in 2006. So these are big numbers. That's our philosophy, that's our value. The Liberals' is com uh, point of view is completely different. They believe they know best how to spend your money. And you know what, raising taxes? Well, you gotta have higher taxes and pay for programs if you're gonna wanna be in a, in a, in a Liberal type of Canada. So they're looking at, at running deficits. Can you imagine, after all the hard work to get us out of deficit and get a, a, a balanced budget, they're, they're advocating budgets for three years and no one believes three years of deficits under the Liberals. I mean, just look provincially. Does anybody believe three years of, of deficit under the Liberals? No one. It's gonna be way longer and it's gonna be higher than 10 billion. Secondly, they're going to raise taxes. They're going to take more of your money. They're going to impose carbon tax. Have they spoken about carbon tax? They have not. But, and when they do talk about carbon tax, they talk about polluters will pay. Well, I'm looking around here, I see electricity. I'm sure you drove your car here. You are a polluter. You Absolutely. will pay. Yep, and everyone Guilty that's watching charged. this program, you are a polluter too, according to the Liberals. Not according to us. According to us, you are hard-working Canadians who deserve to keep more of their hard-earned money to um, uh, suit their own priorities, you know, in order, to, in order to live their lives and to raise their families. So these are two completely different values between Conservatives and um, Liberals. I believe in the Conservative platform. I, was, I raised my family of five children. I too believe I am the best decider as, as the husband of my family on how to spend our hard-earned family money to raise our family. I don't want to send more money to the government and let, you know, Justin Trudeau and the Liberals decide for me. That's what they did when my kids were younger and I didn't appreciate it. I would have rather have had it so I can invest more in education, in sports, in vacations, in whatever I think are, is best for my family. So these values are different and um, as an MP, you can see from um, <laughs> the way I'm answering your question, I'm better aligned with the Conservative Party than with the Liberal Party and there is a real difference, a difference that will matter to Canadians and matter to the people of Clarence Rockland. The, the only problem is for how do people who are unemployed or unable to work for various reasons, either because of mental health issues yep. or disabilities, the, what happens to them? They, they can't choose how they're going to spend the money, they have none. 
Well, you've raised a really, a really good point. And, and you're asking really about jobs and you're asking about poverty, for example. Yeah. Oh, for whatever reason, there is poverty and there are many factors that contribute to poverty. So um, first, let me start with jobs. Um, especially in our rural riding, jobs are very important. And as a uh, conservative government, again, it's a difference between us and the Liberals and the NDP. As a conservative government, these low tax policies I'm talking about have resulted in the economy creating 1.3 million net new jobs since the recession. What does that mean? That means that there are 1.3 million new jobs after you take away whatever job losses there were. Does that help Canadian find new jobs? Absolutely, because it, there's a wide spectrum of jobs there. Now, two thirds of those jobs are high paying jobs and 80%, at least 80% are full time jobs and at least 80% are in the private sector, which is perfect. So what I'm saying is that for people who want to find jobs, uh, no matter what their capabilities and talents are, you have to have jobs to offer people. That's why we're focused on creating jobs as conservatives. And when there are jobs, people take jobs and that, that's a good thing. So we're helping that way. On the poverty side, this idea of low taxes, it is leaving more money in people's pockets. And just to give you some numbers, uh, the um, UNICEF, which is not us, right? That's the United Nations, issued a report on child poverty in Canada. They stated that Canada, uh, since the recession, uh, because of our economic policies as conservatives, we have lifted about 225,000 children out of poverty. Child poverty right now is at one of its lowest levels um, in Canadian um, history because of not just because of our economic policies, but because our economic policies are what they are, they help lift people out of poverty. Uh, seniors, uh, because of tax breaks and um, programs that we've offered to seniors, about 330,000 seniors have been lifted out of poverty. So these are big numbers and they matter in people's lives and uh, it's a good track record upon which to, to work. The last way I'll also uh, answer your question is, oftentimes the social services that are delivered to help uh, families and seniors and disabled people are, are delivered by the province. So, uh, and you know, they do that through social services and they do that through the healthcare system. I would say those are probably the two primary mechanisms. So, you know, what do we do as the federal government to help with that? Uh, so I'm gonna give you an example about, again, what we stand for as conservatives. In 2006, we transferred to Ontario uh, about $11 billion in what we call federal transfers. So that's $11 billion that goes from the federal government to the province of Ontario. The province of Ontario spends that money on social services and on healthcare. Those are pre predominantly the two key areas. This year we transferred $21 billion. So $11 billion versus 21, it's almost double. I don't know anyone's salary, who's which has doubled in the last um, nine years. But the money we've moved to Ontario has doubled. So we feel that we have absolutely stepped up to bat in terms of providing, for example, the province on, of Ontario with the funding, the federal funding they need to deliver social services and health services to the people of Ontario. It's a huge amount of money and it, it's just on such a sharp growth rate. What did the Liberals do when, uh, back in the 90s when they were running a deficit and um, you know, they were trying to find some savings? Well, they cut transfers to the province. That's what they did. So these are two completely different solutions. The Liberals cut their transfers on health care, and I think we all remember those days. We remember when hospitals were closing, when wings were closing, when there were uh, layoffs in the medical sector, when services were no longer covered. There was a lot of angst and pain and suffering that resulted from that. And then the conservative record is we've almost doubled the transfers to the provinces, even though we've been in difficult economic times. So again, two completely different approaches. Um, I prefer the conservative approach, which is why I'm a conservative MP. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Well, that, uh, those figures certainly speak for themselves and show how much the Conservative government has helped. What it doesn't show is how much of a hole the provinces were in and how much needed to be filled and how much of it has been filled. Sure. Of course. And sure. we know that at the municipal level, the problems are beyond, beyond reason, the, the right. infrastructure needs. And right. So if I may just comment on that. Uh, uh, provincial governments are elected themselves and they are accountable for their spending decisions. And, um, you know, if the Liberal government in Ontario is going to run massive deficits while, while cutting services all over, which is kind of what we see in the education field and the health field right now. 
the voters have to hold them accountable. They're deciding that as an elected provincial government. When it comes to municipalities and infrastructure needs, I just want to give you some real numbers about what's happening here in Glengarry Prescott Russell. Since being elected in 2006, I have delivered over $130 million in federal funding to our municipalities to fix things like, for example, roads, bridges. Right here in Clarence Rockland, there was a $28 million water project to move water out to you know, Hammond and Bourget um, to improve the drinking water quality. Well, I delivered uh, $8 million. Our government delivered $8 million in federal funding on that. So there have been tens of millions of dollars into Clarence Rockland alone. Across the riding, it's been about $133, $134 million. I would call that uh, responsible leadership when it comes to helping our municipalities here in Glengarry Prescott Russell with some of their infrastructure um, challenges. We're not, we're not very important on the, in the whole scheme of things in this area. We're not a big industrial area, we're not high tech, we're not a big tourist area. How, what arguments do you make to, to get this funding here as opposed to somewhere else where it's also needed? Yeah, so I think we are important. I think that's what these numbers show. It's not, um, when I look at the total amount of federal funding I've announced for the riding, um, I have to add in what I've also announced for economic development, yeah. what I've also announced for um, our social and cultural um, type heritage that we support. So total, it's about $170 million. I, I would say we are important. Um, I would say that the Conservative government values the people of Glengarry Prescott Russell. That's why we see this level of investment. And why, how have I been able to get those results? I think I work very hard on understanding the priorities. Like I think I'm the kind of person who wants to understand the details, who asks uh, questions about things so I understand them better. I think I have credibility, credibility amongst the people that I represent, but I have credibility within the government and in parliament too. So uh, I don't make wild-eyed claims. I have a balanced argument, a reasonable argument, a forceful argument, backed up by facts and backed up by a thorough understanding of what the priorities are in the riding. And I think the people in the riding appreciate that because it's clearly I have to take an interest in the riding to acquire that information, but I want to know all of that. And I think they see the results of that. And that's why um, people like the work that I've been doing. They really like the work I've been doing. And they can see the tangible results. Like when people in Clarence Rockland look at the hockey academy and the two ice pads that are there, Federal funding helped put that in place. That would never have been a reality without federal leadership and federal funding. And yet that is a jewel here, an international hockey academy with public ice services that the people of Clarence Rockland can use uh, for them and their kids as well. This is a, a, su a success story and it's a jewel right here in Glengarry Prescott Russell. And I can just tell you sort of quite humbly, but quite honestly, that would never, ever have happened without federal funding and, you know, a good, a good amount of federal funding to make that a reality. All right, so money has come our way, and we, but we're still, still in a quandary. You're, you're most familiar with the issues that we've got with the highway. And yes, highways are provincial jurisdiction. But then again, how much money the province has for these things depends on how much is transferred to them. And we're back to that argument. Is there anything that you could see in the future if there were a conservative government that would help ease that process along, which has been a tremendous thorn in the side of economic development in this you area? You mean the widening of the 174? The widening of the 174. Right, so let's go back to the beginning of this project. It, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's been uh, an issue here, I think in Clarence Rockland and in, in this part of the riding for probably 20 to 30 years. It's been a very long standing issue. I think particularly with respect to uh, not just traffic and perhaps the pollution that results from that from a safety perspective. And when there's work being done on that road like there was just yesterday or when there's an accident, it really puts the safety of people at risk. So what have we done about this? Well, as the federal government for the first time, like, you know, the liberals will say, oh, they have a solution. Well, you know what? They never delivered or announced any funding for this project at all ever in the history of this riding or in the history of wanting to widen that. When I was elected in 2007, I announced $40 million of federal funding on a road that is not federal to help widen that highway. So am I there? Yes. Is the Conservative government there? Yes. Did we deliver meaningfully? Yes. But who really is driving that project? Like, who is it that, 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 that is moving the project forward and really decides on the timelines? It's not a federal road. 
I have tried. I have tried to work very closely, particularly with the City of Ottawa. They have a plan, but their plan is very slow and methodical. Um, the province has some options. The province could take the road back under provincial authority and therefore take on a leadership role to get that road widened. Um, I think if any federal MP said, well, we could do that federally, you know, and I'm going to get in there and solve this problem pronto, I'm just going to say that is not reality. I'm a hard worker. Like I, like I mentioned, I like to understand situations. I like to understand the facts and the details. I've been working on this project since before 2007, and right now um, it's the city of Ottawa, that, which owns 16 kilometres of that road. So that road, here's some facts. That road is 22 kilometres long. 16 of it is sitting in the city of Ottawa, which means that they have uh, predominant control over the direction of this project at this point in time. The United Counties, the United Counties owns six. The province owns none of it. So the province has perhaps leverage that they could apply on Ottawa, and um, the, or they could also upload that section of the road and take full leadership of that road. But uh, despite my sort of repeated uh, efforts to move things along quickly. It is not in the federal realm and because it is not in the federal realm, there's no federal candidate that can sit here and say, oh, I'll have that done. It's just not reality. All right. <laughs> but, but is it an important project? It absolutely is an important project. Will I support the province in decisions they make? Absolutely, I will support provinces and decisions that they make to move that project along and widen that highway. Like I said, I'm, I'm worried about uh, the safety of people on that road. And I feel that by announcing and having announced $40 million in federal funding, I feel I have certainly contributed it in a meaningful way to a solution. It's just right now, there's an environmental study that's making its way through. And um, uh, the province, I think, has to take a more, uh, a stronger leadership role um, in moving that project along in a more, uh, in, in a quicker and more effective manner. Well, in the meantime, there are businesses closing in this area. There are villages that are not developing to their full potential. So the economy is suffering. And I don't think that agriculture and the dairy industry and whichever have picked up are, 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 be, are able to compensate for it. So if you were to come in after the October 19th election, I think there will still be a lot of people knocking on your door asking for more handouts. Oh, ab absolutely. And, and you know, I think, hand I think handouts is the wrong word. Uh, like, oftentimes the funding we deliver is what I call, um, it's the initiator. Uh, it's like the spark that allows the project to kind of like, you know, uh, flare up and actually take some life. Oftentimes, companies that, that big businesses, like for example, on, on economic development, I've worked very hard. It, I've been saying for the last many years that my focus as an MP is on creating jobs in the riding, strengthening our local economy. And I just met with businessmen from the Clarence Rockland area just last night. And I was thanking them for the jobs they create in our riding. And I was thanking them for the services they deliver, which are so important because if families, if we want families to move out here, the families don't want to have to run back into Ottawa for everything they need or run into Montreal. They want to get it from their local community. So uh, it is our small business people that are doing that. And uh, as an MP, I have um, delivered about $28 million in economic development to small companies and businesses to help them succeed. Mm -hmm. However, you know, we also have a platform, which we can get into if you like, about what are we going to do to help them in the future? And for example, what's the contrast with the Liberal Party? I'd love you to ask me that question, <laughs> but I'll leave it to you. <laughs> Gee, Pierre, there was a question I was going to ask you about. <laughs> what is the contrast with the Liberal Party in terms of economic development? Right. So um, we are very focused on uh, low He's taxes. He's persuasive, if nothing else. Yeah, we're, we're, we're very focused on low taxes for businesses. Why? For the same reason we are for consumers. In a business, if more money stays in that small business, then the, the business has more money to perhaps uh, be able to weather a difficult economic time like now, or they have more money to actually grow their workforce and hire somebody. The more money you take out of a company, the less money they have to work with. So, so when I'm speaking with business owners like yesterday, what, what did I tell them? Well, I said, well, you know what? The federal tax burden on small businesses under us is about 30% less than it was under the Liberals just before us. That, that's a lot of money that's staying in your companies. And I, I also mentioned, for example, um, we are not going to raise the CPP, the Canadian Pension Plan. You know, that's what Kathleen Wynne wants, and jo Justin Trudeau has said to her, he wants it too. 
But let me tell you what this means. Let me tell the people watching the show what this means. If the CPP goes up, let's say you're somebody that, that uh, earns $30,000 a year and the, the, the CPP goes up under Justin Trudeau, you will be paying an extra $500 a year into the CPP plan. I don't know many families that have an extra $500 to give up to Justin Trudeau so he can just have a bigger CPP plan. And because most of the families I know are walking a tight line, right? They've got uh, their families, they've got fuel, they've got taxes, they've got uh, payments on their house. Like they don't just have $500, like sure, let me put that on the table for you. And if someone's earning $60,000, it's gonna cost you a thousand bucks a year. That's a year. And if you're a two income family, let's say you just have, you know, someone, two people earning 60,000. Well, your family can kiss $2,000 goodbye on the increased CPP. And what's behind that? Well, Justin thinks he, he can tell you, the, the Liberals feel they can tell you how best to save your money. They're saying, we don't think you know how to save. We're gonna force you to save through the CPP and we're gonna increase the CPP. It's for your own good, trust us. And you're saying, well, that's gonna cost me $1,000 or $2,000, depending on the family, a year. Well, we know better. Um, our view as a conservative is why don't we offer you, why don't we lower your taxes first of all? Why don't we not raise the CPP and give you options? Why don't we give you um, our RSPs to contribute to? Why not the tax-free savings account to put money into? You decide whether you want to save money, how much you want to save, and what tax saving vehicle uh, you want to use depending on your family situation, your job situation, etc. Now, if the taxes go up on CPP, so you're an employee, you pay CPP, and I just gave you the numbers. I'm an employer, I'm employing you. I have to match your CPP payments. So this is gonna not just cost you $1,000 a year, it will cost me as the employer $1,000 a year, except if I have 60 employees, that's $60,000 a year. I don't have $60,000 a year to give the Liberals. What, what will I do? Well, most uh, business owners have said they're going to have to lay people off. They're going to lay somebody off, take the salary they would have paid him, and pay it into the Liberal CPP plan. So how does that create jobs? That does not create jobs. So again, there's a marked difference. You know, all parties will say, yes, we're going to create jobs. But when you actually look at the details and the content of what the parties are putting in front of Canadians, you realize there are very different plans here and some of them are actually going to kill jobs, not create them, despite what is being said by that party. And other ones, just logically, like, I'm not asking people, like, you, you, believe me if you're conservative, I'm just saying if you look at the numbers I'm giving you, and these are not numbers I'm making up, uh, these are valid numbers, if you look at the numbers I'm giving you, you will see that logically our conservative plan helps create jobs. The liberal plan actually is going to kill jobs is what's going to happen. And especially in a rural, I, I worry about that in a rural, um, uh, a rural environment like ours, uh, where we have rural economies, and, we, and you're right, we have certain challenges, don't we? So we need to do everything we can to help create jobs in the riding, not, not, not take them away. What happens to those people who are unemployed and who are not making money to put into an RSP? So what would you, the best message we could possibly give to an unemployed person is, we have a job for you. It, isn't that, like, they're young, they're ready to work, the best, the best news you could possibly give them is, not only do we have a job for you, we have 10 jobs you get to pick. Or you can apply for 10 jobs, let's find the one that's best suited for you. So this, the, the idea of job creation is very persuasive and it's very important and meaningful. And if you also say, you know what, when you get that job, you have more take home pay, you know, to, to meet your own needs. Well, that's a very, very good message too for them, uh, for their families. And during that time that they're on, uh, unemployed, when they're unemployed, then there is an employment insurance. Like employment insurance is a, it's a robust program and it is there to help people who are unemployed, to give them that, you know, to help sustain them in that window in which they are looking for a job. But I think the thing to understand is they are looking for a job. Their ultimate goal is to find a job. What the government should be focused on are the political um, initiatives that will create jobs so you see you know, no it's not, you don't want to see no jobs, you want to see lots of jobs from which to choose. That's what we're offering. And in fact, I'll just finish by saying, not only have, has the economy created 1.3 million jobs under our economic policies as Conservatives, in this election, the Prime Minister has committed to helping create another 1.3 million jobs between now and 2020. 
So it's not like it's 1.3 million now, I think we've done enough. No, it's 1.3 million dollars, uh, sorry, 1.3 million net new jobs, and we are committed to continuing it, this for the, to answer the very question you've just asked about, well, what about people who don't have jobs? Yes, the answer is let's create jobs. Good, because the August figures were 1.5 million Canadians unemployed. Absolutely. So if there's a way to cover yep. for those, but that's going to take five years? Well, no, uh, no, no. It, it, the the, the uh, creation of jobs would, would start immediately. Like it's, it's going on right now, but what we're saying is we're going to ensure that our economic policies will foster the creation of 1.3 million jobs. It doesn't mean nothing until five years, bang, there's 1.3 million. It means there will be job growth, which will total 1.3 million net new jobs by 2020. Okay. So it, mean, it really means that is our focus. And I think that should be a great uh, relief to Canadians that, that not only are we saying that we want to create jobs, we're actually committing to putting in place what's necessary to create that level of new job uh, growth. Do you think it would be useful to bring in more immigrants, refugees, to help boost the economy, right. work at the jobs? So that, those are two, two different questions uh, because there are immigrants and there are refugees. So on the, on, when it comes to immigrants, um, we have done so much work in our immigration policy. Uh, and and it's, gonna be a, it's a bit of a partisan statement, but it really is, it was, it is, our work continues to clean up really the mess that was left. Uh, I will tell you that immigration was in shambles when we first took over. Um, and we've put in so much time and effort passing laws in Parliament to do two things. The first, really, if I, if I can sort of, we've done many things, but really, what are the focuses? What, what exactly is it you're aiming at when you're changing immigration law? We want to make sure that uh, immigration serves Canada. That's, you know, it's got to be in the best interests of Canada. And so there are jobs uh, in Canada of this 1.3 million. We want to make sure that Canadians have first access to those jobs. But if there are jobs left over and there are immigrants that can come in and are willing to take those jobs and that helps our economy and that will help a business to uh, move to the next step, then our immigration should be aligned that way so that when immigrants come, they are contributing to Canada, to Canada's success and to our economy. The second part of our immigration has been to protect the best interests of Canada, which can also mean security. So the immigration policy, we've been making laws, for example, if there is someone here who is um, uh, not a Canadian citizen, uh, they've immigrated to Canada, and uh, they commit a very serious crime. Should they be staying in Canada? We think not. That's not contributing in a positive way to Canada. So we, uh, and, and I think that this came up uh, as well on the refugee side, so this is maybe where the two touch a bit, because refugees are generally escaping persecution, uh, which can also be life-threatening persecution. And that's a bit of a different scenario than what I was talking about with immigration, which is meant to reunite families or it's meant to contribute to Canada, uh, Canada, Canada's economy. But in both circumstances, we feel as Conservatives that Canadians are very concerned about security. And so a balanced approach, we are an open country. Uh, the, I, I believe the number of people who became Canadian citizens is at its highest level ever. Under, under conservative policies. So these are very positive outcomes. However, Canadians are concerned about security and we must ensure that the proper measures are taken to protect the security of Canadians as well and the security of Canada. So it's a, it's a balance, it is a balance, but I feel uh, we are very good at finding that balance and we feel that Canadians feel we're good at finding that balance and that they support us in this. All right, well. You will soon find out. Absolutely. <laughs> no, actually, I don't know if you will find out. You will find out. You will find out nothing because you're going to find out that people like you, and you don't know if how they're going to feel about the rest of the policies. But certainly, you've made a good case for them. Well, thank you. And I have to say, and I, I have to read this out because you have been in our constituency's life in so many respects, from seniors to the environment, to women, to veterans, to people with disabilities, to small businesses. You've been there. You've been there for everybody. You've been there at all of the events. So frankly, whatever happens on October 19th, I think we owe you a resounding vote of thanks oh, well, thank for you. all of your efforts. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And thank you for giving me the opportunity too to sort of explain the different policies and some of the things we're doing and why we're doing them. It's been greatly appreciated. All right. Thank Good you. Kat, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.